you might see these kind of laws. And I'm not saying that the Brits are going to just roll over and die. I don't, I don't think so. I think Brits are going to fight back. But when ordinary people start fighting with the governments, uh, it's never good for the society. Um, we're going to go towards anarchy and chaos. Where now they can formally create a political power within the system, using the system to overthrow the system. Your local MP is not responsible for what's happening in a distant land. And the current state of British politics is so bad that these kind of people who can't even string up a sentence of English are now councillors of certain British councils. The UK is not really that big of a player on the international scale either. So why punish the British public for what's happening in Gaza? All right, folks, this is Harris Sultan. And as you guys know... In the recently concluded local body elections, a lot of independents contested those elections. A lot of Muslim independent candidates contested those elections. The reason they did it was because they were not happy with Labour's anti-ceasefire stance, especially early on. So in November last year, Sir Keir Starmer, despite a lot of pressure from his Muslim constituency, did not call for a ceasefire. In November, of course, that was just unreasonable. I mean, you just killed 1,200 of the civilians and you're asking them to hold fire and basically not defend itself. So it was so preposterous that even Sir Keir Starmer did not call for a ceasefire. So Muslims got unhappy and they said, well, we'll show you who we are or what we can do. As you guys know, the entire Muslim vote goes towards the Labour Party. Because Labour is a leftist party, they appease Muslims, and you know the unholy alliance of Islam and the left. But the Muslims said that you can no longer fool us and now we're going to show you our strength. We're going to show you the power of, as they call, the Muslim vote. So a lot of independent Muslims contested elections against the Labour Party. The Labour Party still won, but a lot of Muslims won. And I'm sure you saw a lot of those Muslim candidates celebrating their victory in those local body elections. Raise the voice of Palestine! Hey, look, I'm Pakistani. Some of those candidates were so pathetic that they could not even string up a sentence in English. And the current state of British politics is so bad that these kind of people who can't even string up a sentence of English are now councillors of certain British councils. So basically, this was just a trailer and they wanted to show that this is what we can do. So unless you bend to our will, we're going to hurt you significantly in the upcoming general elections, which are now going to take place on the 4th of July. So is the Labour Party worried about it? I've spoken to some experts. I'm not an expert in British politics. I've spoken to some experts. These heavily Muslim-dominated seats, they only make up around 20 to 25 seats. So these 20 to 25 seats, yes, they could be useful when it comes to pressure politics, but on their own, they don't mean much. So the Labour Party would not be totally blackmailed by them, but the Muslim vote people are no bums. The Muslim vote people also know that Labour is not going to submit to their every demand. So what is their counter plan? So I'm going to tell you what they're planning. But before we go further, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And if you'd like me to continue making awesome videos like these, then you can be my patron by going to patreon.com forward slash Harris Sultan, or you can buy me a coffee. The link's below on your screen. So let's get to today's video. So this so-called the Muslim vote, what are they planning for? How are they going to pressure the Labour Party? Or what if the Labour Party doesn't fully submit to their will? What are they going to do? What is their counter plan? Check out this video. Rishi Sunak has called a surprise general election for the 4th of July. That's only 42 days away. But this election... What are they going to do in these 42 days? ...is going to be about Gaza. We refuse to accept building our lives, our communities, our future here in this country on the dead bodies of our brothers and sisters overseas. Today the Muslim vote is more concerned about what is happening in Gaza rather than the economic health policies of their local constituency. Your local MP is not responsible for what's happening in a distant land. Yes, your prime minister or your foreign minister could have a say, but the UK is not really that big of a player on the international scale either. So why punish the British public for what's happening in Gaza? 
You should be looking at who is the best candidate for your health policy, your education policy, your transportation policy. George Galloway, he understood this. And what a conniving that that guy is. He knew that in Rochdale, all he has to say is that, oh, I stand with the people of Gaza. Keir Starmer, this is for Gaza. You have paid and you will pay a high price for the role that you have played in enabling, encouraging, and covering for the catastrophe presently going on in occupied Palestine in the Gaza Strip. It's okay, you can't stand with them, but your job does not require you to do that. Your first and foremost priority is the people of Rochdale. Not what they want in a far-flung conflict, but what they actually need in their day-to-day -day lives, like transportation, infrastructure, health policies, education policies, etc. That's your priority. But no, he doesn't care because he knew, if I want to win these elections, just say I stand with Gaza. The Muslim vote has one point agenda. They're only concerned about what's happening in Gaza. But as I said, we don't need to panic because they only have over 20 to 25 seats. Yes, good pressure tactic, but on their own, they have no value. Today, we spoke to Dr. Wajid Akhtar and Omar Suleiman to discuss the Muslim vote, a united movement among the UK Muslim community like never before. That's done loads of research into Muslim constituencies and even held a national... Look at this. So this is a Muslim woman and she abstained from voting for ceasefire. This is it. They're punishing the Labour Party for not asking for a ceasefire back in November 2023. And although she's a Muslim, but she had to follow the party's line and she abstained from it. But have a look at it. The Muslim electorate is only 40%. It does seem like less than 50%, but not everyone votes. Muslims are more politically charged up. Muslims are more politically astute. Let's just say if 20% of the local Brits don't go to vote and all of these 40% go, then you're screwed. This is why I'll make a separate video on that and I'll draw some parallels with Australia. In Australia, voting is compulsory. That's why the voter turnout in Australia is around 90 to 92%. Whereas in America and Britain, where voting is not compulsory, the voter turnout is only around about 40%. Most white people, most native British people don't go to vote. This seat could be an independent Muslim who would only be concerned about what's happening in Gaza or what is in the best interest of the Muslim Ummah, as they see it. The other 60% of the native British people who have just been lazy and not going to go and vote, they're going to suffer without knowing that they're going to suffer. This is how stupid the whole system is. Make voting compulsory. And then all those lazy Brits who don't go and vote, they will vote. As bad as they might be, they're not going to vote for someone who is only concerned about Gaza. Even the blue-haired Wokies would not be that simplistic because we know that's how it works in, in Australia. This is the reason why the left and the right is still very much in check in Australia because everyone votes. People in the middle who are lazy, who would not have voted, also go to vote. And then they just say, okay, who makes the most sense? That's why Australia has not gone to the dogs. But fingers crossed, let's hope that it stays that way. So in my opinion, I think compulsory voting is going to save Britain. Otherwise, these people, these people, 40%, 42%, 39%, in effect, these guys are more than 50% because most natives don't vote. Assalamu alaikum Jazakallah khairan for having us over here. So for me, the Muslim vote is three things. Number one, no ceasefire, no vote. So mm -hmm. the reason the Muslim vote came into existence was because of the uh, the catastrophe that's taking place in Gaza right now. And the idea is that those who did not vote for the ceasefire should have some consequences at the electoral box for their mm -hmm. refusal to stand up for basic human rights. And there is consensus amongst Muslims. And I, as I have said this before, whether you're a radical Muslim or a lipstick Muslim, it doesn't matter. Anti-Semitism is so prevalent in Muslim society that they don't want to hear the other side of the argument. They have no empathy with those 1,200 people who got killed by Hamas. As far as they're concerned, Israel should be dismantled and Israel must not retaliate in self-defense. That's their position. This is a unanimously agreed upon position. Even 
moderate Muslims believe in that. 7% of the British population consists of Muslims. And 20 to 25 constituencies are dominated by Muslims. And that's how they think. Number two, I think the, the first point we can all agree on, but the second point, it becomes... Bill's See, he said that. The first point we can all agree on. All Muslims agree on that. Screw Israel. Israel doesn't have a right to exist. And it must not retaliate against Hamas's atrocities. That's a unanimously agreed upon position. Even lipstick Muslims believe in that very firmly, as dogmatically as a fundamentalist Muslim would. On that second point, is that it's about principle-based politics, oh. not party mm. or personality-based politics. Really? What do I mean by that? Up to now, what we've tried to do as a Muslim community is party-based politics. So Labour gets the vote. And a lot of people now are saying, okay, if we're not going to vote for Labour, let's move to the Lib Dems, let's move to the Greens, let's move to the Workers' Party en masse. But we're saying, no, let's step away from just going for a party blindly. Let's also step away from personalities. This is so-and-so individual. They're from my clan, my ethnicity. I like them. Therefore, it doesn't matter what they do. We're going to vote for them. It doesn't work. We're going to go for principle-based politics. It's rich coming from him because all these independents that these guys are endorsing or propping up, the only thing they have in common is that they're your average Muslims, Abduls and Ali's and Muhammad's of the world. This is pure and simple tribalism. If you're brown, you have a beard, regardless of your policies, just vote that guy because he's a Muslim. This is happening in Britain, 21st century Britain. No allegiance, no loyalty to British values, but their own set of values. And I don't need to remind you how barbaric that set of values is. It's going to start like this. It's going to start like, oh, you know, we're just speaking about the human rights of Gazans. And then slowly it's going to spread its tentacles as it has done on an amateurish level in British society. Have Sharia courts here and there, have no go zones here and there. Now it's going to happen on an organized scale because you're going to have MPs who will have the mandate of their local constituencies. An MP would actually say that there can be no bars in this region because my constituents said that to me. That's how I actually won the elections. I won the election on a promise that I would shut down all bars, all nightclubs, all gay clubs in this constituency. Now it's going to happen on an organized scale. What used to happen in an unorganized manner, it's going to happen on an organized scale. That's what the Muslim vote entails. Are you ready for that? Islamic Republic of Britannia. Oh, no, actually, they wouldn't even let you keep the name Britannia. <laughs> They'll even take that from you. Well, we've been trying to warn you, but you didn't want to listen. And I think you still don't want to listen. These virtue signaling, pathologically altruistic, blue-haired Wokistanis, they don't want to listen, and they're the first ones. They will be the first ones to suffer the most. I think I'll be there. I think I'm going to have some sort of sadistic pleasure out of that when that happens. And the third part is unity of purpose, not uniformity of views. As an ummah, we have so many diverse opinions really? and ideas and strategies, and we just can't function if every single time we disagree, we break apart. We need to be able to work together to have a unity of purpose. To have a unity of purpose. I'll, I'll explain that to you, what he it, what it means by that. Despite uniformity, despite, um, despite uh, different views. If I was to summarize that, I would say, the Muslim vote is so he's basically saying that there are some moderate Muslims who have different opinions and we don't agree on that you know some moderate Muslims say well so what if someone is gay leave him alone some moderate Muslims do say that and that's where they disintegrate there's no unity amongst Muslims and he's saying we need to find common values I wonder what those common values would be or the shared agreed upon unanimous values what would they be Sharia God is one Prophet Muhammad is supreme. His teachings are commandments for us. And that will affect women's rights, LGBTQ rights, dissidents, ex-Muslims, blasphemy. So this has telltale signs of an organized Islamist movement in Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing the first official 
organization and mobilization of Islamization of Britain. Before that, it was all unorganized. It was through backdoor channels. It was like, okay, funding a little mosque here and there or propping up some activists and funding them indirectly and then creating these no-go zones. And the West, instead of going hard at them, they let them evolve into this stage where now they can formally create a political power within the system, using the system, to overthrow the system. Well, we've been trying to warn you for a very long time. So these upcoming elections are very important. A lot of people, a lot of Brits have actually given up and they have accepted that the Labour Party is going to win the next elections. And I'm telling you, five years under Labour, what's going to happen in those five years? Britain may not be able to recover. You're going to see draconian laws. You might actually see blasphemy laws you might actually see imprisonment for calling out the bad behavior of Muslims. You might see these kind of laws. And I'm not saying that the Brits are going to just roll over and die. I don't, I don't think so. I think Brits are going to fight back. But when ordinary people start fighting with the governments, uh, it's never good for the society. Um, we're going to go towards anarchy and chaos. Jeez, I sound like a doomsday prophet. Look, they're saying that. What do they say? Never underestimate the enemy who actually says that this is what I'm going to do to you. This is what I'm going to... They're telling you what they're going to do. And you're just sleepwalking into it. You have no worry in the world. So you think these 20 to 25 independent Muslims who have nothing on mind other than Islam first would not be pressuring the Labour Party? You really think that the Labour Party is not going to take decisions or pass laws under duress from these people? Do you really think that? If you think that, then, well, maybe you deserve to be conquered. That's going to happen. Anyway, like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you'd like me to continue making videos like these, then you can support me on Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash Sultan, or you can buy me a coffee. Until next time, ta-da. If you'd like to support my work, you can become my patron by going to patreon.com forward slash Sultan, or you can simply buy me a coffee.